arm power. And therein we know lies the success of this organization. And that farm power is not in Corning. That farm power is not here in Kansas City. That farm power is in the grain bins. It's in the dairy barns, in the feedlots. That's where the farm power is. And we want you to go home and use your influence to cause that farm power to be gelled and brought together so that when we meet next year, we can talk about that $1.5 billion that we talked about earlier that will be moving through the channels of this organization. It will be done with county leaders. It will be done with county committees. And no other way will we be successful. And then I want to remind you that the home office there in Corning is open. And as you travel back that direction, I say that direction, and it's any direction but south, if you're going east, west, or north, take a small detour and stop in there. And someone will be there to show you through the office and explain to you what we're doing there. So let me encourage you to make that stop. Now, I know you're interested in what we've been doing as far as signing up production in the organization goes here at this convention, and the grain department just handed me a note, and I want to refer to it and let you know how much grain they put on contract for sale yesterday. One day, they put 12 million bushel on contracts for sale yesterday. Now, as you prepare to leave and move towards your home, I want you to keep two or three things in mind. And I'm going to move on from item to item very rapidly and remind you of the things that we have talked about, more or less in a capsule that you can take home with you. There is no business that can operate by allowing those who consume the goods that they manufacture to price those goods. There is no business that can survive if they turn the pricing mechanism to, of their product over to those who buy. And this organization, this industry must not, it cannot, allow those who buy to determine the value of those goods and survive. And of course, we're dedicated to reversing and putting a halt to that trend. We're dealing with that program with forward contracting that will put stability into the organization. Hence, we'll be able to put stability and confidence into the minds of the buyers that we are a source of supply. And becoming that source of supply, then in fact, the price will follow. But you must have volume before you can talk price. And after the volume is built, I can assure you that the price will ultimately follow. How do we know that we can be successful? I hope the departments talk to you about some of the things, and there was one I intended to that I forgot yesterday. And I'm going to refer to it very briefly and hopefully take a little different approach than they did if they talk to you. But the South Sell-Off program that was introduced November 6th at a press conference, we done it for several reasons. First of all, we saw the hog, hog market decline 40%. And as it did, we knew that this put the hog producer in a financial uh, embarrassing position. We also knew that the market, as far as the buyer was concerned, I'm speaking of the consumer over the meat counter, those who bought the finished product, it only declined 7.5%. And we felt that somewhere between there, there was something going on that needed to be taken a look at. And so we submitted to those in position of authority that they need to take and review the packing industry, the retail outlets, because we felt they were making more profits off from hogs now than they have made in 20 years. And we still feel very strongly that way. As we announced the program, we weren't sure how much following we would get. But we felt that if we gave the leadership and we coordinated that movement, that others would follow with us. And 
our feelings were justified because as we ran a chart as to the trend, we maintained a 2% increase of sow slaughter during that period of time when all predictions was that the market would decline during the holiday season, Thanksgiving, and so forth. That market moved from 32 cents to 38. And we sensed what was happening. The packing industry called us and they said into effect, fellows, what are you trying to do? Do you know what's gonna happen? And our response was, we certainly do know what's going to happen. Well, they passed out a token increase to discourage and to disrupt our program. It didn't work because the hog producers and farmers and ranchers in general now are becoming professional enough that they know they must have supply management that they themselves control. And so we saw this reaction. And we're going to move from the South sell-off program into another program which will be blocking sows, blocking slaughter hogs, cattle, and we'll continue to block and get that support of people. The encouraging thing was is that people followed leadership and that we were the only one to recognize that need and do anything about it. Well, let me go to another item. As I sat in a meeting not too long ago with the Import-Export Bank, a gentleman proposed the idea and said it was happening that because of the Iranian crisis that we have been going through for nearly two months, the OPEC countries are now afraid that we may or have the possibility of imposing a food embargo against any country that we may have disagreement with. And they have the oil, they have been able to accumulate the money. And that they now are going out worldwide and buying farms in every country that they can get a foothold in. The OPEC countries are. They're trying to protect themselves and guarantee themselves a supply of food protecting themselves for a potential boycott from this country or any other. They're becoming self-sufficient. We are told by projectionists that by the year 2000, this country may well not be an exporting country, that we may well be only able to feed our own people, that real estate and agriculture land is being gobbled up at the rate of two million acres per year. It takes three and a half acres to feed each new mouth that comes into society. And because of that, we may only be self-sufficient in the year 2000. I think we need to take a serious look at where we stand as farmers and ranchers. We're the envy of the world. We now own the major industry in the world, and most surely in this country. And there are going to be those who want to take it from us, and they'll do everything within their power to cause that to happen and take it from us. The Secretary is out on his listening conferences, his dialogue meetings, and as we have met in there, we have cautioned him about the dangers of restructuring agriculture. The main danger we see is if the wrong people get involved in the restructuring process. And we have asked that we be a part of that discussion group. And I feel confident that honor will be, that request will be honored. As you know, some time ago, in many of the dairy areas, our people being very firm and strong in those areas, we know that, and we had reported to you time and time again, that those that were our competitors there, the co-ops, and even some of our competitors in the grain companies, that they were somehow paying just a little more than the market could offer. And it put us in an embarrassing position because we knew what the market was, and then they were able some way to pay just a little more to cause us embarrassment. And year after year, we went through this explaining to our people that it wasn't a true market. Someone was borrowing. 
Well, the chickens have came home to roost. They were borrowing money, and now with the interest rate that they now have to pay on that borrowed money, they have had to increase their checkoff twice what ours are and begin even to look at a third increase and re-blending back to their people. The interest rate now has caused the chickens to come home to roost. And in all areas, with few exceptions if any, we are now the strong dominant force at the marketplace in that arena. And we are only there because our people understood and held firm on those programs they believe so strongly in. I want to make one more statement before I sit down. I think it's unfortunate that American agriculture, we have divided ourselves as households into more than 2.7 million voices. I think that we ought to speak as agriculture with one single voice. I think we no longer ought to compete with each other as farmers and ranchers in this country at the marketplace. There is new leadership now in the major farm organizations. Your organization had a change in leadership 11 months ago. The Grange has now new leadership as of two months ago. The Farmers Union is changing leadership next month, and there is discussion as far as leadership in the Farm Bureau. And perhaps it's the appropriate time now that we sit and design a dialogue that we all recognize that we have failed totally to solve the farm problem. And perhaps the time is ripe. Perhaps it isn't possible totally. But I think we need to start moving toward that goal. And it won't happen overnight. But perhaps we need to form a federation of farm organizations comparable to the giant labor federation of the AFL-CIO. Well, maybe it can't be done. Maybe we just need to start a dialogue and encourage our people in areas where we can, on state, national issues, to work on those things. And if the legal problems develop, I think there must be a way that we can solve those problems. And I'm going to do what I can to revitalize the National Farm Coalition of farm organizations and urge all NFO chapters to meet with their legislature on issues that they can agree on and that they have a common clear interest in and that they take and work on these specific issues and encourage a broader coalition and council encouraging U.S. farm groups to move toward unity on all farm matters of all kinds. I think this organization can give leadership to it, and I pledge to you an effort to cause this to happen. As we look at ourselves, we're few in number, and if we allow ourselves to be fragmented, we become fewer. And I think the time is critical that we must move closer together on issues that we can work on. Well, in closing, you're going to be hurrying home. You're going to be trying to pass that car that's not moving quite fast enough. And you're going to become impatient because you want to move down the road and you're going to come to some slick and icy spots. And I don't want any of you to have to look at each other and say this. Here lies the body of William J., who died maintaining his right-of-way. He was right, dead right, as he sped along, but he's just as dead as if he had been dead wrong. Don't let that be your fate. Move toward home cautiously, carefully, and we'll meet again a year from now. Thank you, and so long.
These girls will not let me do anything wrong. I'm going to ask you to do this when you go. As you move to the escalators, there's going to be boxes sitting there. And in those boxes are letters that I have written. And those letters are a capsule of what's happened at this convention the last three days. Those letters are addressed to farmers and ranchers out there somewhere that I don't know. And I want you to be the mailman. I want you to be the postman that takes that letter to that farmer or rancher that surrounds your community. I want you to put his name on the outside of it, open the letter, read it, and then at the bottom it's going to ask you to put the name of whomever you want him to contact with any questions he has. If he's a dairyman, put the dairy rep's name at the bottom, meat and grain accordingly. Then you take personally and hand that letter to 10 farmers in your community around your home. That's what we're going to ask you to do. So when you go down the escalator, you move there, you take a half inch pinch of letters. Take a half inch pinch of letters as they're sitting there at the table. We'll have them. Uh, if they need help, line up more boxes, more tables, whatever it is, but get those pinches. Now, there will be a news release available for you to take home to your county. Where will it be found, Bill? Right down here at the corner of the stage. If that's all, I'll now recognize a motion that the convention be adjourned for 12 months. Is there a motion? Microphone number three. I so move, Dalton Mender, South Dakota. You make the motion? I make the motion. Is there a second to the motion? Number two. Delmer Burstler, Iowa County, Iowa, second the motion. All those in favor, stand up and move to the front. Thank you. Father Kaiser, who is the vice president of the Catholic Rural Life Program. And I'd like to introduce him to you as the delegates. And as he and I visited before this meeting, we find we have many things in common and that they're working on a program very similar to what we are as far as reaching people with what is being recognized as a serious threat to agriculture in this country. Father Kaiser. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Woodland. I really appreciated your remarks last night, as you already indicated in your State of Affairs message. Those words really thrilled me because of what I am personally involved in with the Catholic bishops of 12 states of the heartland. And I would very much enjoy talking a bit about that this evening, uh, but I decided not to. Because last evening, Devon, you expanded our vision, and at the same time, you continued to specify the role of National Farmers Organization in the world community. And while being very conscious of the far-reaching interdependence of peoples in our global community, we're also increasingly sensitive to, the, to how critical it is for the small family farms and the small rural businesses and institutions to have the freedom of being independent and self-sustaining. So that tension that we experience between our independence as a, rural, as a world global community and the need at the same time for us to be independent and somewhat self-sustaining is something that really gives us a great deal of courage and hope new vision for what our role is and our work is. This is the 25th anniversary of National Farmers Organization, the celebration of building farm power for 25 years. And I am indeed 
honored to be just a small part of this historic convention. And it's also my privilege as Vice President of the National Catholic Real Life Conference to bring to all of you the congratulations and the continued support of the National Catholic Real Life Conference. Mr. Bill Schaefer, who is recently our new executive director, asked me specifically to express his congratulations and his interest and his ongoing concern and support for the National Farmers Organization from our National Catholic Real Life Conference. And he speaks that on his own, in his own name, but also for our entire staff there in Des Moines. Many of you know very well the great dedication over quite a number of years of the Monsignor John George Weber, who I think in all of his years as co-executive director never missed an NFO convention. He's presently enjoying a pastorate in Hoxie, Kansas, back in his home diocese. And certainly, all of you know of the esteem of our immediate past president of the Catholic Real Life Conference, Bishop Morris Dingman of Des Moines. And I can assure you, in the work I'm continuing to do with him, he will be continually dedicated to the rural church and to rural Mer America as it's so well known to you. His leadership and commitment to achieving collective bargaining for agriculture will continue in the Rural Life Conference. <clears throat> I'm also confident that I can assure you that our newly elected and chosen president of the Rural Life Conference, Bishop Lawrence McNamara of Grand Island, Nebraska, he will also be the young, fearless leader that he is in promoting the dignity of the American farm family and all the principles of collective bargaining. And so, in behalf of all who are at the National Catholic Rural Life Conference, I have the privilege of again extending to all of you real, sincere, and well-deserved congratulations on this 25th anniversary. Like the Rural Life Conference, you have often felt like a solitary voice in the wind. And we think, and I'm sure you think, and are very much assured that this is changing thanks to the sacrifices and the dedication of many people who have often been tired and discouraged. But now that investment is paying off. And I think truly it's a new day, there's a new spirit, there's a new generation being born. And it's wonderful in our eyes to behold and to be part of that. What seemed so far off, so difficult to accomplish, collective bargaining for agriculture, is now not so far away, not so impossible. Many thought we would never see the day when master contracts would be signed. And now I think we can be assured, yes, we will see that day, and we will glory in it. Now we know that our rural communities can be saved, they can be rebuilt. And in the context of this 25th Jubilee that we're observing, I think we might well call to mind that no marriage is ever complete in its work. No marriage achieves all its potential in 25 years. And so in National Farmers Organization, there's still much to be done, much to be achieved. There will always be new horizons. There will always be the need for new hopes and new dreams. A marriage is a lifetime commitment. And it seems increasingly, and we're thrilled by this, that National Farmers Organization commitments must be for a lifetime. And it thrills me during these days now to hear you talking not only of five-year contracts, but lifetime commitments and contracts. 
somewhat perhaps the question that arose in the minds of the parents of John the Baptist when he was named came to my mind this afternoon when they marveled and they wondered what this child was going to turn out to be. Hopefully we can still wonder and marvel at what this organization is going to be. As you all know, on October 4th of this year, Pope John Paul II came to Des Moines, Iowa. And as you also know very well, he did not come to visit the people of the area of Des Moines, Iowa. He came to Des Moines, Iowa to visit all of rural America. And that he did. At the Irish settlement outside of Des Moines near Cumming, Iowa, he said, my pastoral visit through the United States would seem incomplete without a visit to a rural community like this. A small, unpretentious church at the center of a group of family farms is a place and a symbol of prayer and fellowship, the heart of a real Christian community where people know each other personally, share each other's problems, and give witness together to the love of God. On your farms, you are close to God's nature. In your work on the land, you follow the rhythm of the seasons. And in your hearts, you feel close to each other as children of a common father and brothers and sisters of one another. How privileged you are, and that in such a setting, you can worship God together, celebrate your spiritual unity, and help to carry each other's burdens. I heard those words from Pope John Paul as we stood there, 340 to 50,000 of us at Living History Farms, and they conveyed that message live over radio to us there. And then later, we heard him say some more. And it seemed to me, in listening to him, that he was speaking a very special message about the National Farmers Organization in the United States. Because the goals of your organization are indeed economic stability, but far more importantly, spiritual and social stability and progress. At the Living History Farms, Pope John Paul said, you who are farmers support the lives of millions who do not work on the land, but who live because of what you produce. It's the dignity of those who work on the land and of all those engaged in the different levels of research and action in the field of agricultural development, which must be unceasingly proclaimed and promoted. I feel that I've been around a bit, and I feel that I'm reasonably observant of the human condition and human situation, and there is no group in our society who are fulfilling those responsibilities and hopes like I think National Farmers Organization is doing. The day is past, thank God, when you don't have to apologize for justifying your efforts legally, economically, or morally. That, enough, that would be enough, I think, really, to make these 25 years well worth every effort that any of you have put into the organization and all that it hopes for and dreams for. <laughs> However, lest you rest too easy, I suggested already that 25 years in marriage does not end the work and the potential and the possibilities that are still there. So I think we need to be very realistic, perhaps even more realistic, about the work that is yet to be done. And I would just recall to your memories what you already know, some more of what John Paul told all of rural America at Des Moines. 
and he lifted up and outlined three attitudes that farm and rural people must have. And he said the first of those attitudes must be one of gratitude. Rural and farm people must be always conscious that while God alone is the source of life, yet man and woman are truly co-creators. What gratitude must be ours as we participate in some of the fathering work of God. You passed a resolution yesterday reaffirming your commitment to life. And in my view of the human situation, the human condition, I cannot see it any differently than this. The right to life carries with it the right to food. And the right to food, in turn, carries with it the right to some access to the process by which the life-sustaining elements are produced and shared about to the human community. And this is where we in America, and especially in rural America, need to have that attitude of gratitude. Because such a wealth of God's favor is ours to enjoy and ours to share. And so very logically, Pope John Paul lifted up as the second attitude that we must have as that of being good conservationists of the soil. And you are doing that more, and you make more of all of that reality possible than any single group I know. As someone remarked to me just in the supper hour now, that there is no one in their county who is not a churchgoer. And that's so typical that the membership of this organization truly is a, is a Christian and not necessarily Christian, I must apologize for saying that, are God-fearing people and willing to give God the gratitude and the worship that he deserves. And that, in the way that we care for the soil, because of our marriage with it, our relationship with it. But the question that all of us struggle with, I as someone who try to bring God's message more clearly to people, you as you try to live it in the farming enterprise, the thing you have to struggle with is, all right, how do we care for that soil as God wants us to care for it, and yet be pressured as we are to get maximum bushels, maximum production, to just keep your own heads economically above water? And there again, I can say this compliment on your 25th anniversary. There is no organization like the NFO that can address that economic and that responsibility of conservation as you can do it and are doing it. The third <clears throat> attitude that Pope John lifted up for us was one of generosity. And he said, you who are families are stewards of a gift from God which was intended for the good of all humanity. You have the potential to provide food for the millions who have nothing to eat, and thus you are able to help rid the world of famine. Again, there's a deep tension in giving that charge of a world Christian leader to an organization like your own, because that attitude is there, but the struggle of how to do this when there are so many other pressures and still so much greed in the human community to help you or to tempt you to betray that. But again, I trust the jury system, and very much I see the strength of our jury system in what inspired, what continued, and what will continue to make the National Farmers Organization be what we all hope it will be. 
because those kinds of responsibilities that are ours in the world community, those kinds of opportunities that are ours in rural America, you have been addressing. You have been morally concerned about, and now the day will come when you can fulfill those deep responsibilities that you feel. I've chided the South Dakota organization on a number of times about the failure to mention very often Article 8 of the membership agreement. And that is what I would leave you to ponder just a bit this evening. Because that challenge of John Paul II to us about being gener generous in this bounty that is ours, the framework the means, the way of doing that is clearly in your membership agreement. Again, a thing that no other organization in our country has. The foresightedness of those who formed that membership agreement and the dedication of people like yourselves to try to implement that indeed is a great work not only of man but truly a work of God. If the hungry are to be fed, it's going to have to come for quite a while from the bounty of those who have that bounty at their disposal. This organization can rise to that challenge, and I know that increasingly you will. This indeed has been an unexpected and a great privilege for me and I sincerely thank you, Devon, personally, for giving me this time. And I'll just suggest again, by way of announcement, if any of you would like to join us at 7.30 in the morning in room 290, 209, excuse me, I will be celebrating Mass with anyone who wants to join me. God bless. <laughs>